Nuremberg, 1615. A mob is screaming for blood. They want a spectacle of extreme violence. Executioner Franz Schmidt knows only too well that he must feed their demand lest he end up on the chopping block. This is going to be the most pain he's inflicted on anyone in decades. Can you guess what utterly horrifying things Franz is about to do? It's a true story, but we'll save it for later in the show. First, let's have a look at how medieval torturers weaponized rats. The Rats Just like many punishments during the medieval ages, some were standard and written into law. But ever so often, a sadist would come along and devise a new method of torture. In those days, with total impunity, some men would literally cook up what they thought would be the absolute worst kind of torture. The best evidence we've found of rat torture actually comes from the 20th century, when human rights groups talked about South American military dictatorships using vermin as a method of torture. In the 1970s, under Argentina's US-backed regime, rats were used on men and women along with a device called a rectoscope. We don't think we need to describe how that went down, no pun intended. But they probably got their idea from Germany in the 1600s, when an interrogation might take place involving a cage placed on the man's chest and starving rats placed in the cage. The idea was the rats would chew into the man's flesh, which would be made worse if the guy's stomach had been cut beforehand. There's also talk of this being done, but with something being put over the victim's head. According to the book The Rise of the Dutch Republic, military officer Diedrich Sonoy was partial to rat torture during the Dutch revolt against the Spanish Habsburgs. The book states that Sonoy would put a clay pot on the prisoner's chest and then put hot charcoals on the pot. The heat was so intense the rats went crazy, and there was only one way they could escape the heat. Downward. They would scratch and bite, and if the victim already had a wound, well, they'd make a huge mess of them. It's doubtful they could have burrowed into them, although the book says the rats were supposed to gnaw into the very bowels of the victim. Even if they didn't get far, there was a huge chance of infection at a time when treating infections was very difficult. But this was small-scale punishment. When it came to showing the entire country you meant business through torturous punishments, you couldn't get much better than the Ming Dynasty. Meet the Ming The Ming Dynasty was perhaps the best-known dynasty in China for utterly barbaric punishments, which included flaying and slow slicing. Could there be anything more brutal, more shocking for the victim than being flayed alive? We'll let you decide once you've heard all the stories today. Long before the Mexican cartels flayed their enemies, the Chinese Hongwu Emperor Zhu Yongzhang was a passionate proponent of the act. In the 1300s, he engaged in what you might call flayathons and slow sliceathons. Just so you know, both procedures can sound similar, so it's not always easy to understand which one those old Chinese texts are talking about. In 1393, the Hongwu Emperor had 15,000 people executed after he suspected a military general named Lan Yu was plotting against him. The 15,000 number was related to a punishment known as kinship extermination, so anyone even vaguely related to Lan Yu had to go, many of them flayed and slow sliced. The emperor's men massacred thousands of Nanjing just because he thought that people had been speaking badly about him. In another purge, he had about 40,000 executed, again some by slow slicing, which took days on end as constant screaming filled the air. The emperor ruled by fear and took drastic measures that were sometimes outrageous, at least to us modern folks. On September 24, 1392, he created a new law. He said no men could have their hair cut in the Mongol style. The punishment for this was castration, not only of the recipient of the haircut but also by the barber. The reason for the law, of course, was the reasonable fear that some of the people in this country started allying themselves with Mongols. But mere castration was being let off lightly. According to the book Unofficial Records of the Rise of Ming, by a man named Yu Ben, who became a bodyguard for the Emperor Hongwu, his boss had 5,000 women, including his precious concubines, flayed in just one go because he thought they'd been getting it on with another man. The book states, His Majesty suspected them of liaisons with outsiders, so he ordered over 5,000 women to be flayed, stuffed with straws, and put on display. The eunuch gatekeepers met the same fate. Making eunuchs was a punishment in itself, to anyone in this day and age, that is. These men who'd been castrated often worked as servants, sometimes as secret police or even as part of the imperial bureaucracy. They could sometimes rise up and have quite a lot of influence. Having no need for women, they were supposed to be trustworthy. They were chosen as kids to work for the ruling class, and before they hit puberty, they had their plums and pecker carefully removed with a very sharp instrument. The wound was then covered in herbs and other mixtures to prevent pain and infection. Another option, well, not an option for them, was their private parts being crushed in a vice. 
While this was better in regard to infections, it was incredibly painful and traumatizing for the kid who might just die anyway. The emperor that followed Hongwu was known as the Yongle Emperor, and he was just as bad if not worse. If he had the slightest suspicion someone was against him, he often had that person executed, usually by a thousand cuts, slow slicing. Like the former emperor, he often had that man's family and relatives executed in the same way. In 1421, he ordered 2,800 concubines, eunuchs, and servant girls be flayed to death after a scandal in the harem. It was alleged that one of his concubines had been having an affair with one of his eunuchs. What an irony it is that the emperor's name, Gyeonggul, meant perpetual happiness. Chinese history texts say how someone was sliced or flayed was often decided by the executioner. In some cases, people could pay bribes to make the execution as painless as possible, or they might be able to purchase pain relief potions. Such executions could be over very quickly, but sometimes it would take hours for the prisoner to die. That's why it was sometimes called the lingering death. It certainly took a while for the eunuch Lu Jin, who in 1510 was executed for plotting against the Jiangdi Emperor. The news that spread out of Beijing was that Lu Jin's execution lasted into the second day, by which time he'd been cut 3,357 times. The story goes that witnesses to this lengthy execution insulted him by buying a bit of his flesh for one kyon, similar to how we regard one penny. The texts say some of them took the parcel of flesh home and ate it with a mug of rice wine. Even if someone was only partially flayed, they'd usually get an infection and die. But more often than not, they'd check out way before that from shock. Hypothermia was also a common killer given the person no longer had skin. Not only did the Chinese flay people, there's ample evidence that Assyrian kings engaged in such barbarity from time to time. One of those kings once wrote, I have made a pillar facing the city gate and have flayed all the rebel leaders. I have clad the pillar in the flayed skins. Like the Chinese version, there was a fast and a slow way to do it. The Assyrians would usually start with the feet, making it a very long and agonizing procedure. But one of the worst flaying stories comes from 16th century Europe, the prolonged execution of a military officer named Marco Antonio Bragadin. In 1571, he was defending the city of Famagusta in modern-day Cyprus when his army was overwhelmed by Ottoman forces. Bragadin managed to cut a deal. The people of the city would be allowed to walk out unharmed as long as he accepted defeat. They were also offered a safe passage to the island of Crete. This was going over smoothly when the Ottoman general, Lala Mustafa Pasha, got into an argument with Bragadin over some missing Turkish prisoners. One thing led to another and Mustafa had his guards cut off the nose and ears of Bragadin, after which he was imprisoned and tortured while every last Christian left in the city was massacred. He was then tortured for days on end and in one final humiliation was dragged to the town square and flayed in front of a jeering crowd. This was later painted and sketched by various Renaissance artists. If this couldn't get any more brutal, he was then quartered and his body parts were paraded around. But that wasn't good enough for the Turks. They'd had his skin sewn back together and stuffed with straw. Then they placed that stuffed effigy on an ox's back and made it walk through the streets where people laughed at a former general riding on such a funny animal. Could there be anything worse than being flayed? What about this? Boiling. Being boiled alive is absolutely horrible, which is why Roman Emperor Nero did it to thousands of Christians who were boiled in large drums of oil. We also know what happened in the medieval age, when that portly wife-killing king Henry VIII wrote it into English law in 1531. He made boiling alive the statutory capital punishment for people who'd been found guilty of petty treason, killing or violating an authority or social superior such as your lord. The law stated, Every person or persons which hereafter shall be indicted and condemned by order of the law of such treason, poisoning shall be immediately after such attainder or condemnation committed to execution by death of boiling. That year, a cook named Richard Rouse felt what it was like. He'd been convicted of putting poisoned yeast in some porridge which ended up in the household of the Bishop of Rochester and among the poor folks of Lambeth Parish. Seventeen people got really sick and two people died. Anyone with any sense would know harmful bacteria could have spoiled that yeast. Food in those days was off all the time. But Rouse was convicted anyway, and under the new law, he went to the pan. The event was witnessed by a group of spectators who were sick to their stomachs. Some of them later said something along the lines of, let's stick with chopping off heads for God's sake. One person wrote, he roared mighty loud, and divers, women who were big with child, did feel sick at the sight of what they saw and were carried away half dead and other men and women did not seem frightened by the boiling alive, but would prefer to see the headsman at his work. 
Those words fell on deaf ears because a few months later a female cook named Margaret Davy was boiled alive at Smithfield Prison for the same offense. There's also evidence of it happening north of the border in Scotland, in a punishment they called the Kettle. It's what's happened to a nobleman in 1321 named William II de Saul after he'd been accused of cruelty and dabbling in black magic. As you'll soon see, accusing someone of messing around with the so-called dark arts back in those days was a convenient way of getting rid of them. It also sometimes involved a medley of terrifying tortures. Boiling would consist of a person being lowered down, likely with a rope and pulley, into an already boiling pot of water, oil, or tar. If the liquid was already boiling, the initial contact would be incredibly painful. Let's imagine the person was pulled right out. In that case, they would likely survive, just as a young woman did recently when she fell into a thermal at Yellowstone Park in the US. I was in the worst pain I've ever felt in my life, and I don't think I can really compare it to anything she said later after 18 operations saved her life. So boiling was incredibly painful. First your flesh would be cooked, then your organs started to boil within the liquids of your own body. If your head went under, you were doomed. But for the minute you'd be alive, it would feel like you arrived in hell. Alas, boiling never really took off in that part of the world, and in 1547, during the reign of Edward VI, the king wrote it out of the law books. The Stocks during the Middle Ages, there weren't any cops, at least cops that we would compare to our modern-day counterpart. It wasn't until the 17th and 18th centuries that we started seeing proper cops, the first of which you could say was the Metropolitan Police Service that appeared in 1829 in London, England. In the Middle Ages, villages and towns often had guys who patrolled around, watchmen who made sure bad things didn't happen at night, but in many cases in the countryside, you had a village chief and a community that would apply the law any way they wanted. Criminals were often branded for their deeds and thrown into the stocks. So when a thief had a big old T on his face, or a drunk got a D, they carried this mark of shame around. And people were duly notified about this man or woman's criminal past. When he was in the stocks, people knew what he'd done because of this brand, and they would act accordingly. That was what we modern folks would call a misdemeanor for something like shoplifting. England's Statute of Laborers, written in 1351, stated that the stocks should be used for unruly artisans which we guess would now include YouTube creators with a penchant for pushing the boundaries. The question is, would our viewers pelt us with rotten cabbages? You don't have to answer that. It wasn't the pain of being in the stocks that bothered most people, it was the total humiliation. Kids would tickle your feet until you could take no more. If a person had really offended the good sensibilities of the villagers, someone might bring out a pan full of steaming cow poop and throw it on the person's head. Not pleasant in a baking hot summer when the flies were in force. If you're wondering why we're putting this meager penalty in a worst punishment show, it's because we aren't done yet. Just think about something for a second. A guy living near you has been a total nuisance, bullying kids, stealing bicycles, basically just getting on everyone's nerves. Then the next minute he's fastened in some stocks in the town center, and you and anyone in your town can do what they want to him with impunity. Let's imagine that happened in any modern country today, especially in one of those tough industrial towns. Yep something really bad would happen. The same sometimes happened back in the Middle Ages. A man might lose a nose or an ear. The pillory. But worse would happen in a similar device called the pillory. When someone was put in this contraption, they were at the mercy of the public. That didn't always happen if they took pity on the person, but people being people, sometimes they didn't just throw mud or poop at them, they'd take an ear or an eye as a trophy. Sometimes they stoned the person so many times that their face would start to look like hamburger meat. Victims were sometimes even killed. When the highwayman John Waller was put in the pillory, the records show that because of the indignation of the populace, they pelted him to death. Although these two were bad, they pale in comparison to the punishments received by so-called witches during the Middle Ages. The Great Witch Hunt In 1486, a German clergyman published a book that would lead to the torture and death of tens of thousands of women and some men. That book, The Malleus Maleficarum, talks about witches, the black magic they might use and how to find them, and then what to do with them. It was basically an A to Z of witches, the witches wiki, written by a man who obviously hated women. It was as if Ted Bundy had been asked to write the law. It kicked off the great witch hunt that over 200 years led to the brutal deaths of around 100,000 people, mainly women, accused of communicating with dark forces. Women were interrogated in the vilest ways, which included having metal pairs inserted into certain areas of their body. These were aptly named the pairs of anguish. Sometimes their hands and feet were held over flames. They had bits of them chopped off. Their blood was drained. Red-hot pincers were applied to their most sensitive parts. 
At times, their interrogators would attach weights to their legs and make them sit on what was called the Judas Cradle. It was a horror show. Other devices used on the heretics in those days were head crushers and knee crushers. These methods had the goals of maiming and extricating confessions, which of course would result in the death penalty, usually burning at the stake for women but also hanging. Everyone confessed because the very thought of having their knees crushed compelled even the most devout person to say they used broomsticks for their go-to mode of transport. We tend to laugh when we see witches on broomsticks today, but back then such a thing led to horrific human rights abuses. Before the public even saw the accused women, they were sometimes placed in what was called a witch's chair. This iron chair would be heated from below, slowly and agonizingly burning the victim. Sometimes, while strapped in it, a device called the turcos would be used to rip off their finger and toenails. Thumb screws would crush their thumbs. Witch hunters popped up all over Europe, promising worried townsfolk they'd search high and low for the dangerous women in their midst. Such women were, in fact, merely people who had unique opinions or possibly acted strange due to some kind of mental illness. And let's face it, who wouldn't be mentally ill when surrounded by people like this? Also, when women had enemies they wanted to get rid of, they took advantage of the hysteria by accusing them of being a witch. When a victim howled during their torture, they said such piercing screams could only mean she was in league with the devil. This was the European torture catch-22. If she didn't scream, the devil gave her strength. If she did scream, the sound she made came from the depths of hell. Soon, we'll show you the Chinese torture catch-22. In the 1600s, Matthew Hopkins became Witchfinder General, a bounty hunter working for God who asked English villagers for 6 to 25 pounds so he could cleanse them of witches. It was a license to print money and engage in dark, misogynistic fantasies. Sometimes the women were taken from town to town like a one-woman attraction. On the market days, witches would attract large crowds. It was like a big soccer match today. Artisans would travel from far and wide to sell their wares, knowing the new witch would be popular and they could do a lot of business. It might sound strange to you that the vast majority of the public would be down with this, but they were told that it was normal. They thought it was normal, and those that were against such barbarity were afraid to speak out because they could be accused of being witches. The witches would be brought out for a few hours in the market square and the mob would throw mud, poop, or rotten vegetables at her. One old report noted that one day the public brought with them all the apples, eggs, and turnips that could be bought, begged, or stolen. It also mentioned stones. The 1563 Act Against Conjuration, Enchantments, and Witchcrafts said for a first offense they got the pillory. For a second offense, they shall suffer the pains of death. This usually meant being hanged in England, although in Scotland and elsewhere in Europe, they were often burned at the stake. The normal procedure consisted of women being strangled to death first. Thousands died like this, first under Queen Elizabeth I and later under the guy famous for the translation of the Bible, King James I. To give you an example of a witch trial under James, just after he got hitched to Anne of Denmark in 1590, his ship was caught in some really bad weather that almost sunk it and killed everyone. Rather than blame the elements, they blamed the witches in Scotland's North Berwick, close to the capital of Edinburgh. Using torture as an interrogation method, his men soon got a woman named Agnes Sampson to admit she'd used witchcraft to try to sink the ship. She said that she'd tied parts of a cat she'd killed and sent it to sea on top of a sieve. She then ordered the cat's bits to fall into the sea, which naturally created those huge waves. She hadn't actually done any of this, of course, which shows you what torture can do. During the North Berwick witch trials, about 100 women were arrested. Some confessed, but not before they were tortured. Samson was forced to wear a scold's bridle, a metal head casing with pins that held down her tongue and pushed against her cheeks. Unable to talk, she couldn't cast any more spells. After days of sleeplessness and constant torture, she confessed to 53 indictments. Other women had their fingernails pulled off, some had their fingers and thumbs crushed in a device called pillywinks, similar to the thumbscrew. Some were fitted with special wooden boots, aka the Spanish boot, named after the Spanish Inquisitions. Wedges were driven into the boots with hammers crushing the woman's fibula and tibia. The witch trials in Europe are a good place to look if you want to know about torture. Now that we've talked about what happened to women, let's see what men got for the worst kind of crime. Hung, drawn, and quartered. March 28, 1857. A man named Robert Francois Damien is on his second day of horrendous torture almost three months after he tried to assassinate King Louis XV. Tell the truth, Damien's attempt had been quite pathetic. He'd run up to the king's carriage as he was getting out and used a small knife to stab him. The knife barely penetrated the king's fine clothes, but that didn't stop him from becoming panicked. Thinking he was dying, he even apologized to his wife for cheating on her many times. 
The top of the blade had barely entered his skin. His tearful admission to his wife hadn't been worth it at all. It was very embarrassing for the king, so by God, Damien had to suffer for this. Damien was not all there mentally. He hadn't tried to commit regicide for any deep political cause, he was just out of his mind. But his interrogators didn't know that, so they tried to ascertain if he was part of a bigger conspiracy to bring down the French monarchy. That morning, when he was dragged in front of his interrogators, he muttered under his breath, La journée sera rude, the day will be hard. First, they crushed his feet inside a pair of those special boots we just talked about. Crushed feet would be enough to get anyone to talk, but the interrogators were far from satisfied. They grabbed hold of his hand, the one he'd used to inflict that pathetic injury on the king, and dipped it in molten lead. Damien howled, a noise that later caused nightmares for those who heard it. He still wasn't giving up any names. He didn't have any names. The interrogator grabbed a pair of pincers from the embers of a fire, glowing red, they were used to rip off chunks of Damien's flesh. He was still conscious but in shock and barely seemed to register the excess when hot oil was poured into his wounds. His torturers were just getting started. Damien had to be made an example of. The public, most of whom were screaming for blood, wanted to see the pièce de résistance. That happened a month later at the Place de Grève in Paris, where a large crowd of spectators gathered giddy with expectation. First, they tied his arms and legs to a wooden cross. They cut him open again tearing chunks off his arms, thighs, and chest and applying hot oil as they'd done during the interrogation. Amazingly, Damien remained conscious through all of this, albeit in agonizing pain. Entire families watched in silence as the executioner used sulfur to cauterize his wounds. Damien was not supposed to bleed out before the main event. The crowd's opinion started to change, though. People who turned up hoping for extreme violence were starting to look concerned. They became even more horrified when they chopped off Damien's right hand and then used wax, oil, and sulfur to dress his wound. How on earth had he not fainted? He was still conscious and looking at the spectators when they tied his limbs to a horse, but the quartering part didn't quite work, so the executioner had to use a knife to relieve Damien's body of its limbs. People in the crowd gasped as Damien uttered his last words, O oh death, why art thou so long in coming? Still, many felt obliged to clap when they put Damien's torso on a stake and then lit firewood beneath it. The king told the executioner, the respected Charles-Henri Sanson, it was a job well done. The irony is that he'd be the one responsible for taking off the king's head in the revolution that happened 30 years later. While Damien's execution was actually in the 18th century after the Middle Ages, we used it because it's one of the best recorded examples. Hanging, drawing, and quartering dates back to 1352, when King Edward III of England made it the only available penalty for high treason not just killing royals or regicide, but any major crimes against the state, including spying. The reason it was invented was because the ruling class believed such a spectacle of violence would deter people from committing the same crime. How it happened to Damien wasn't exactly standard. The usual procedure was to hang the person first, not until they died, but not far off. This was a mercy because the next part consisted of using a sharp knife to cut off the victim's manhood, women never got this punishment, making sure he was conscious enough to see the punishment, since the executioner would sometimes pretty much rub it in his face. Then he was disemboweled, usually with the contents being displayed before the man's eyes. Next came the chopping of the man's limbs and also his head. That head was often dipped in tar and stuck to a bridge, sometimes London Bridge if in England. His limbs might then travel far and wide, stuck to bridges or boards in other towns where the public was reminded of what happens if you go up against the state. In England's Treasure Act of 1351, there was a clause that made thought crime an act of treason, since it said that merely imagining the death of the king merited you being ripped apart. While this was going on in Spain, France, Germany, Italy, Russia, Poland, and many more nations, the Brits have become well known for it. Notably, the man, some say terrorist, who we now associate with rebellion, Guy Fox, was hanged, drawn, and quartered in 1606. He apparently got lucky because he died during the hanging part. The English didn't abolish the punishment until 1870, although the punishment was last used in 1782. By this time, as happened in France when crowds despaired at what happened to Damien, people had started to think it was a little bit cruel. Now for a punishment that we consider perhaps the weirdest bit of Middle Ages barbarity. Poena coule. Poena coule, translated as penalty of the sack, goes back to Roman times when for hundreds of years it was the statutory death penalty for the crime of killing one's father or patricide. 
The Romans took this very seriously, given that murdering your pops was an easy way to take his riches and get him out of the family business. This was an incredibly patriarchal society where fathers often have deep mistrust of their upstart sons. In short, the punishment consisted of putting a person in a leather sack, then any number of animals were thrown in. Records show it might have been chickens or dogs, the odd monkey, and worse, a viper or two. The sack was then thrown into a river where its entire contents would usually fight while the sack was filled with water, and then they all drowned. You might wonder what kind of madman sadist came up with the punishment. It sounds more like something from a sick cartoon than reality, but in actuality, it was taken very seriously. Patricide laws, don't forget, were created by the fathers of sons. It's no surprise they came up with what they thought was the worst possible way to die. It was extremely humiliating having to scrap with a bunch of frightened animals as you died, losing all your self-respect on the way. One Roman historian said it was a foul thing, unclean, causing the gods to withdraw their presence from the world he polluted. Cicero said this punishment totally removed a man from nature, so it was far worse than other forms of death penalty in ancient Rome. There's also evidence that it was used as a punishment for parricides, people who killed close relatives. The 6th century law book, Corpus Juris Civilis, states that those guilty of parricide should be sewn up in a sack with a dog, a cock, a viper, and an ape. It happened, and according to Seneca the Younger, a hell of a lot under Emperor Claudius. Ancient Rome wasn't the Middle Ages, but Poena Culei lived on. One of the most gruesome cases known relates back to an alleged Jewish conspiracy in 1144. It started in Norwich, England, where a 12-year-old apprentice tanner named William was murdered. His dead body was later found in some woods. The local Jewish folks who'd done business with William were blamed. This led to people saying they were involved in ritual murder since many kids had gone missing. This, in fact, was one of the earliest stories featuring an alleged murderous cult. Such theories have appeared time and again in modern times, such as the alleged satanic cults of the 1980s. There is nothing like a cult to get the mob going. And so, a kind of witch hunt ensued. The result was mob violence which eventually became one of the reasons for the Jewish massacres under a conspiracy theory called the Blood Libel, which claimed Jewish people ritually murdered Christian young folks as part of their human sacrifice ceremonies. That was all a load of balderdash, but it didn't stop the mobs from going out and grabbing the nearest Jewish person. According to the 1173 manuscript, Life and Miracles of St. William of Norwich, the mobs sometimes put those people into a sack and threw them into the river, calling it divine retribution. Sometimes, this was an impromptu punishment and sometimes it was administered after a summary trial. This was never a go-to punishment in medieval times, but it seems the Germans resurrected it in the 14th, 15th, and 16th century. It's almost certain that Johann von Buch got the sack in the 14th century for the crime of parricide. Indeed, the German law book of the time, the Sachsenspiegel, stated that this was what should happen to those who commit parricides. Quite amusingly, at least to us in the 21st century, is that the law had changed somewhat from the ancient Roman law. The book stated that it was optional to change the monkey for a cat. Of course, getting your hands on monkeys in the Middle Ages in Germany would have been pretty difficult. The book also said that a snake wasn't needed, and it was A-OK -okay to throw the person in the river with merely a picture of a snake. The symbolism of dying alongside a biblical beast was good enough. In Dresden in 1548, the sack ripped after hitting the water. A desperate-looking duo of a dog and a cat swam out and headed to the bank as the man who couldn't swim drowned. The last recorded case in Europe was in 1712 in the eastern Germany city of Zittau. The guy was put in the sack with a snake, albeit a non-venomous one. He was kept under the water in the river for six hours as choir girls at the bank sang a hymn written by none other than Martin Luther. So, the sack compared to the others was what you could call creative. This next one was even better in this regard. A drink of molten gold. If you were one of the indigenous people of South America and you wanted to execute one of the greedy Spanish conquistadors trying to steal all your gold, how would you do it? Answer: You make him drink this stuff. That's what happened in 1553 after the Battle of Tucapel in modern-day Chile when the local Mapuche people got hold of the Spanish conquistador named Pedro de Valdivia. There are several accounts about how this colonizer met his end, and all of them are bloody horrible. The first one states that they chopped off his arms and put his head on a spike. A grislier version of that was written by a Spanish chronicler of the time who said they chopped off his arms, roasted them on a fire, and ate the flesh as the dying man watched. The next account is that he had his heart ripped out, and later his skull was used as a cup. But if we had to choose an account, it would be the one written by the chronicler Pedro Marino de Lobera, 
The story says molten gold was poured into Pedro's mouth, killing him almost instantly but giving him at least a couple of seconds to think about stealing from people. A few seconds is all he'd get since the molten liquid would congeal in about 10 seconds. The thermal injury to the lungs would pretty much cause instant death from pulmonary dysfunction and shock. In 1599, the native Indians of the Hivaro tribe of Ecuador did the same thing to the Spanish governor after feeling peeved about the taxation of their gold. In these early cases, it was noted that the internal organs of the victim burst. Centuries later, scientists using a dead cow revealed that this was possible, but they wrote that the direct thermal injury to the lungs may lead to instantaneous death. The next question is, if you had the choice, would you choose a short and extremely painful execution or a long and torturous one? How about being buried alive? Buried alive and walled up You can go back to ancient China and find instances of people being buried alive as punishment. In fact, the Chinese archives today state this happened during Mao Zedong's disastrous Great Leap Forward. One account says a father simply died of grief after being ordered to bury his son alive. The son must have committed a grave crime to be administered this punishment, right? Wrong, he was accused of stealing some grain. But Mao's cadres weren't innovators. This brutal form of capital punishment goes back centuries, as far back as the Romans, but was also used during the Middle Ages in the time of the Holy Roman Empire. That book we mentioned earlier, the Schwabenspiegel said this was a suitable punishment for a man that had copulated with a virgin without her consent. It also said that if the same crime happened and the girl wasn't a virgin, he would merely have his head chopped off. If you think that's brutal, in Augsburg in 1505, a boy and a girl along with a cook were found guilty of killing their master. The boy went to the chopping block while the cook and the girl were buried alive. In the 1500s in Germany, there were plenty of records of it happening to women who'd been found guilty of killing their babies, infanticide. In some cases, it seems that after she was buried, she was impaled, so the job was finished quickly, although other cases don't mention the impaling. Goes without saying, though, if you were just covered in dirt, you wouldn't live for long, only as long as you could hold your breath. But if you got the coffin treatment based on an average casket buried six feet under, you might survive around five hours. It would not be pleasant. But the good news for all you folks who might get buried alive is the buildup of carbon dioxide would make you pass out and you wouldn't be conscious of your own death. In 1915, in the US, a woman named Essie Dunbar was accidentally buried alive. The dirt had already covered her coffin when her sister turned up and said she wanted one last look at her. When they opened the coffee, Essie sat up. She died 30 years later. We're telling you this so you'll understand that if you're ever immured, basically bricked up in a small enclosure, you'll have plenty of time to think. Rather than dying from asphyxiation, you'll likely die from starvation or dehydration. There are plenty of legends of immurement since it always makes a cool story when you tell someone that people are buried in the walls of an old building. But it did happen. It was actually the Roman punishment for Vestal virgins who broke their vow of chastity, although in the 1,000 years that the law stood, only 10 virgins could resist the lure of a virile fella and got immured as a result. In 1149, Duke Otto III of Olomouc in what is now the Eastern Czech Republic accused a monk of touching his wife where only a husband's hand should wander. This was likely a great big fat lie, because not long after he walled up 20 of the monks for the offense, he took all the monastery's money for himself. Centuries later, when the Europeans were traveling in Persia, they discovered what was quite an original punishment, to them at least. They saw mere thieves buried up to their heads in the ground sometimes pleading with the passerby to cut their throats lest they die very, very slowly. It was actually against the law to help them in any way, even killing them was considered helping. An English writer named John Fryer saw this and wrote, From this plain to lore, both in the highways and on the high mountains, were frequent monuments of thieves immured in terror of others who might commit the like offense. These are plastered up, all but their heads, in a round stone tomb, which are left out, not out of kindness but to expose them to the injury of the weather and assaults of the birds of prey. There are many stories of great leaders dying and their servants or wives being buried in their tombs with them. In Niger in Africa, a British explorer said when a chief died, his four wives' legs were broken and they were buried alive with him. This was supposed to be an honor, but we imagine the kindness was lost on the wives. The practice was common in China when rulers died. Often scores of servants, concubines, and even administrators were buried with the dead man to keep him company in the afterlife, although in some cases the people sometimes numbering over a hundred were executed first. This was still hardly a gold watch retirement gift for years of dutiful service. One story states that Empress Xu Lu Ping lost her dear emperor in the 10th century and she volunteered to be entombed with him. She was talked out of this, so she cut off one of her hands and buried that with him. 
Still, just for good measure, according to the court historians whose words later appeared in the book History of Liao, she had over 100 officials killed and thrown into the mausoleum. According to that book, this was the actual preceding conversation. Her, do you miss the deceased emperor? Officials, the deceased emperor has shown us much grace, of course we will miss him. You could almost hear the, and then she said, if you miss him, then go see him. While we'd love to give you more examples of the medieval age Chinese Catch-22, we think it was time we asked a real executioner, one of the best there ever was, what the very worst punishment he ever metered out was like. The worst of the worst. That guy we mentioned at the start, Franz Schmidt, was the executioner in the city of Nuremberg for 44 years. From 1573 to 1617, he legally whacked 361 people for all kinds of crimes and did it in all kinds of ways. What's great for us is he kept a diary, so we don't need to rely on historians' accounts for what went down. His enlightening and disturbing pieces of writing were later turned into a book. Schmidt spent a lot of time talking about how he practiced a lot with his ever-sharp axe, with the reason being the crowds were known to kill executioners if they weren't pleased with the service. If he missed and it took him a few swings to remove the head, they might tear him apart. He said in the book he'd heard of that happening to executioners in other cities. You had to sever the head in one go, which he said he managed 98% of the time. We should just add that generations of executioners all belonged to the same family as it was an odd job and it made the family a bit of a pariah in the town. After all, one day they might be killing you, and people kept their distance. It was a dirty job, but someone had to do it, so usually the axe was passed from father to son. Franz, like most Germans, thought keeping a person imprisoned was really cruel. It was best that they were sent to the afterlife ASAP. After the trial, it usually wasn't long until they sat with Franz writing letters to their family. Franz said in spite of what they'd done, even murder, he filled them with booze because at the end of the day a drunk person went to the Ravenstone to lose their head a lot calmer than a sober person did. Some folks became hysterical, but he said most of the time they took death on the chin. Now and again someone would get too drunk. Franz said one guy tried to pee on the crowd. Another had a fight and wouldn't let go of his wine bottle even after he lost his head. The job wasn't that well paid, but Franz made extra money from torturing people during interrogations. He didn't seem to have any scruples about this old side gig. It was just a job. But he said there was one punishment that even for him was sometimes hard work. It wasn't hanging, drowning, or beheading, which were a blessing in a way since death came quickly. He said breaking on the wheel took the biscuit, especially when the mob demanded no quick head strikes. They wanted this guy to suffer. During the Holy Roman Empire, it was a very common punishment meted out to thieves, murderers, rapists, and arsonists. It wasn't quite as bad as a crime against the state, but man, did the public hate these kind of criminals. Franz was one of many executioners in Europe who broke people on the wheel. In 1707, a priest in Sweden watched as a man was broken and later wrote, his cries were terrible. Oh Jesus, oh Jesus, have mercy upon me. The cruel scene was much lengthened out and of the utmost horror. In a faltering dying tone, he was just heard to say, cut off my head. People on the wheel begged to be beheaded. Franz said as much. The criminal was accused of killing a young person in the town. The public demanded a slow execution. As we told you, Franz had to do what they said, lest they string him up by the neck. So, when he had a murderer fastened to the wheel, he'd start by bludgeoning the guy's feet and work his way up the arms and legs. Smash, crack, scream, repeat, all the way up. In light of this, the finger choppings and ear clippings that Franz did to poachers or prostitutes really were relative slaps on the wrist. Franz also said that sometimes during the interrogation he performed, the guy that got the wheel treatment had already been ripped with hot pincers. He had his head misshapen in a vice and his feet broken in ill-fitting boots. He said one guy who killed his own father was roundly hated in the town, so he took his sweet time torturing the guy first and then using his cudgel to break the man an astounding 31 times before he died. His strikes started at the feet and ended with the head. Franz turned to the official and asked, Lord Judge, have I executed well? Then came the reply, you have executed as judgment and law have required. After that, the crowd screamed with joy. That was a good day at work for Franz. And the now wasted crowd had their bloodlust satiated. Sometimes it was over pretty quickly though. Franz's diary entry for July 24, 1581 states in a matter of fact way, Then I had the convict put on the wheel and had his arms and legs broken with a wooden cudgel. Then I hit him with an iron bar. The executioner of Rothenburg then broke his legs again, and after that the wheel was raised upright and he was left to die. The crowd that day was ever so content.
and each and every one slowly drifted back to their homes for a night in front of the fire, telling stories of their favorite executions to their captivated kids. Now you need to watch absolutely terrifying last words from killers before death, or have a look at the smallest crimes that will get you the biggest punishments around the world.